photographers contacting you, trying to get work? Mm -hmm. Is there? A, there is, I, I'd love to hear an example. Maybe I don't. Know, maybe that's not appropriate. But of where you press on and being persistent to being a pest. Maybe mm -hmm. give somebody a gauge. I'm sure you, you see both sides of that. Yeah. I, um, there was the guy who moderated the lunch meeting at the yeah. newsroom and kept putting his DVD in your pocket. That it was guy. that guy. And he kept asking me the questions first. Yes, yeah, yes. Of you. He put you in the middle. Remember that, that guy? guy? I remember that okay. guy. I like that guy a lot. Yeah. <laughs> I wish I had that really cool shirt he has. <laughs> See, I told you you liked it. <laughs> um, I used to work... Uh, before, so in between two <laughs> stints at Sports Illustrated, I worked at the White House where I was the photo editor for President Clinton. And I got that job because I figured out who the White House photographer was going to be. And once I figured that out through friends, and then somehow somebody gave me a phone number for this guy, which I called every day, once a day, for 30 straight days. <laughs> and I'm not lying. I'm not making that number up. 30 straight days I called, and I left the exact same message for 30 straight days. <laughs> he calls me back on the 31st day and says, it's McNeely, what do you want? And I proceed to repeat the exact same message I had left for 30 straight days, because now I don't know what to say. I find out that it's like a secondary house he and his wife owned that they rent. He's there, and nobody had been there in like weeks <laughs> later, and then his wife had finally listened. There's a crazy person. <laughs> it's like one of the one or two times in my life that I've ever had that kind of persistence or whatever you want to call that. Um, to do that, so it's not my nature to be that way, it's really not, but I did it that one time because that job meant everything and I really wanted to do that, and I ended up getting that job. And part of it was because I called every single day for 30 days until this guy finally called me back. So my point is that I'm all for people being persistent. It does not necessarily turn me off too much um, if, they're, if they're persistent. I am also very, honest in telling somebody, you're not right for me, so you can stop calling me, at least for now. Um, this isn't, the photography you have that you're giving me is not photography that I'll ever use. So you just need to go find another place for it. Because I don't want to lead somebody on either, you know, it's, it's kind of both lines. Um, I like photographers that are, are aggressive and consistent and, and persistent. I, I do, I kind of uh, value that and I, um, Kind of admire it, you know, and I think you have to have the work to back it up. You can't just call all the time and then not have anything to show for it, um, because eventually they're going to listen to you, um, and it has to be there. But I, I, I don't mind it. I don't. Um, I think that emails are a good way for that. I think mailers in the mail, they're a good kind of way. The great thing about emails, you can read them as we all know, whenever you feel like reading them. The phone calls. Sometimes I, I, I get, if I'm going to get annoyed, it's, it's phone calls. Because if I haven't called you back after like four times or I've said, yeah, I don't know if this is working, and you still call me, it's like an awkward phone call that I could live without. Um, but I can always kind of like gloss over the emails and stuff like that. But I, 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 I like it, and I don't mind it, and I, I think it's a valued asset that photographers have. Because they need to have thick skin. And they need to figure out a, a life that's going to get turned down more than they're going to be told yes. I mean, like actors, I guess. You know, you go in and audition, and you don't get anything, and then you get one, right? I mean, photography is the same way. You show your book to 20 people, and one of them hires you, and you're really excited. But if you think about it, 19 people told you no. <laughs> you know? <laughs> I was going to say, only 20? <laughs> right. I'm sure there's a 12-step program for it somewhere. But it's, you know, I, th I, I think being persistent, I think, is a good thing. And I think that, for the most part, um, you need to be somewhat aggressive. I'm fortunate enough that I'm at a publication that I think has some pretty clear ideals and standards, what it's looking for. And you either kind of know you're in that category or you're not. Occasionally, I literally will get photos from people who are not Sports Illustrated caliber or whatever. And, and that happens. And you try to have a reasonable, respectful, polite conversation because it's, you know, it's not my daily duty to go hurt people's feelings. So, uh, but there are people who send you a photo. I thought this might be good for you. And I'm like, I don't think so. But you know, you don't want to make people feel like a jerk for sending it either. So I, I just want to clarify something. So when you were calling McNeely every day for thirty yeah. days, what year was that? 
That would have been, Preview. he was elected in 1992. Okay. So it would have been bef right after, it would have been December of 92. Basically from the middle of November until the middle of December of 1992. So the, the 2015 version of the 30 day in a row phone call isn't really calling you, right? Because this is being live streamed and I can imagine that <laughs> the thousands of college students who are Googling your phone number right yeah. now waiting to call you. Yeah. So what's the, what's, well, is that, first of all, is I'm going to look, look your phone number up in a second <laughs> and, and give them that Tell, number. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, I have a really interesting story about that later. Um, but is it, is it mailers? You said you like looking at the printed pieces because you can take them on your commute and you can flip through them on the train. Yeah, or? I, I, I like mailers. I do, and I don't mind the emails. I just don't look at them as fast as I look at the, at the mailers and physical things. My, my point was, don't okay. call me 30 days in a row, right. but my, my point was, it, it, but that was for a specific job. Right, that's why I asked you what year. Yeah. Versus just calling in general, can I work for you someday? Right. But um, if there was a specific thing, then yeah, yeah you have to, you have to go for what you have to go for. Not every single job is worth 30 phone calls in a row, but that one time in my life it was worth it. And I haven't done it since, um, except briefly when my wife was mad at me. I had to call her a bunch of times. Through. <laughs> <laughs> that was a different thing altogether. <laughs> she's watching. I know. She's, she's probably not. <laughs> she's the only sane one in the family. Uh, so I, I, I'm sure you guys all have questions, and we'll open that up. I want to have Rod quickly kind of, uh, I think I think of him as more of a behind-the-scenes documentary photographer, but obviously you do some por you do portrait work, excellent por portrait work, too. I'm curious about the process of that. And you, you quickly mentioned you get five minutes with him. Right. Like, what, what does it take to make a nice portrait that ends up on the, in a magazine? I think you have to you have to really think about it first. You don't walk into these situations and just start throwing up lights. You have to do research. Um, if you're working for Brad or one of his his people, they're going to give you information on who this person is, what they're doing, and the why. And from that, then you can do your own research and figure out the best way to do a storytelling photo. And from there, then you start thinking about what's the best environment what's the best light and then you don't i i honestly don't ever want to limit it to one setup i want to give the editors they say we want you to do a okay and make sure you get the player in the middle right so i'm gonna like the first thing my assistant reminds me is craig's got to be in the middle like let's get that out of the way first then we can start moving around and once we get the lighting setup that we talked about we're gonna, sh if we have time, if we get that right, we're gonna do B and C. So that when these guys get it, they can see A, they're like, okay, yeah, that's what we wanted. Like, we don't need this other stuff. Or they might say, God, this doesn't feel right, but this looks nice, or this looks nice, or we're gonna keep this for file. So in that five minutes, I would like to get multiple looks. I would like to, but the first thing is, I wanna know what I'm doing. I wanna know what story I'm trying to tell about the person. And then if it's a player that I know, usually we have, a rapport if it's a person we don't, I'll know something about them. And you the photographers we call it the rap. Like what you can you can you actually engage with someone that you just met for those five minutes? Because if you just stand there and there's that dead silence, then it's gonna go real quick and it's not gonna usually go very well. Yeah. So I think um, one of the things I did for these for these guys this summer was a player who was trying his best to get back in the NFL and he was working out on a high school field <coughs> And he was trying to get a tryout here, and he was trying to get out here, and it was just kind of a story about what it takes to get to the NFL. And so I actually read about his story and, like, knew he played here, knew he played there. Well, I knew a coach from there. So immediately it was like, hey, Craig, you know, God, you played at so-and-so, so you know coaching. So, oh, yeah, yeah, no, I love that guy. Or, no, he was a jerk. And, but then we've got a commonality. Now we're shooting. Now we're talking. Now he's more relaxed. Now I'm not just some guy who showed up. I'm a guy who knows something about him. And I think those kinds of establishing that quick relationship and quick rapport is very important. And then I think the other very important thing for doing portraits with athletes is if you say it's five minutes, or if they say it's five minutes, or they say it's 10 minutes, it's five minutes or 10 minutes. Like, there's nothing worse than going 15 or 20, the PR person's looking at his watch or her watch, and she's giving you the toe tap and the look, and the athlete's giving, and you can blow everything right there and if I do that if I make an athlete mad when I'm working for him he's going to hear about it I'm not representing me I'm also representing Brad I'm representing his boss I'm representing a national magazine so whatever you're going to promise make sure 
that you hold to that promise. Like if the five minutes is not an invitation to half an hour and then some selfies with me for my Instagram and oh, a ball for my kid, it's, it's business. It's quick rapport, get the photo, get a couple of looks, thank you very much. And with our players, if I tell them five minutes or if, if our PR person tells them it's gonna take 10 minutes and I do five and I'm like, that's great, we're done. They're like, really? I'm like, yeah, we're done. So that the next time I need to go to that player, I'm like, hey, five minutes. I told you to be five minutes. It's five minutes, it's not 15. So that helps too. Does that answer? Yeah, that's great. Yeah. Yeah, that's some good advice. Uh, I'm, I do have one more question I wanted to throw out to these guys. Uh, so companies like the Seahawks, the University of Oregon, the Blazers, they're bringing <coughs> journalists in. They're, they're putting their own product out online and everything. <coughs> and I've, in my experiences with the Blazers, I've had the door shut. No, we're not going to let media cover this. But then they put sure. have their own photographer there. And, mm -hmm. and, and then... Uh, so access being one of the few things we have left that's valuable, how, how, how do you guys negotiate with the University of Oregon, for example? Well, like, it's, it's done on a tiered level, almost always. First of all, the first person to approach someone like the University of Oregon for that access in a story is the writer. Almost always it would be the writer because most of our stories are generated through the text group and they come up with the idea, let's do a story on Mariota and what are his NFL chances? Is he really that good, blah, 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 let's just say. So then we have to contact Oregon, but that's coming from a writer's come up with that idea. I mean, we do have photo essays that we generate, but you know, for the most part, we're, photos are contained within the complement of a written story. So the writer will contact it, say, yeah, I'm doing this story and so and so. Then we contact them and say, I hear so and so is doing a story on you, blah, blah, blah. I'm calling because we'd like to get some time photographically. What can we do? And it really kind of just depends on how much we need it. If it's for a cover, I push really hard. If it's for a cover, I beg and talk somebody into something. If it's for a smaller photo inside, I know when to let go and say, yeah, there's no problem. If they can't do it, they can't do it. We'll work around that. We'll move on. You have to kind of balance that because all of those entities. I have to come back to later. You know, who says the Blazers don't win the championship? And if they do, then I have to call them at the end and take their best player and pose them with the trophy. So I don't want a bad relationship with them. Um, but to gain the access, you work as a group together. This is what SI would like to do. And a lot of times it is, you know, convincing them of something because that's the nature of most PR people who work for professional teams is initially they say no to almost half the stuff you ask for. And then the other half, I'll let you know. They hardly ever just say yes right away because they have people they have to check with, coaches and GMs and, and the player themselves. It depends also how popular and how powerful that player is. Peyton Manning standing with the Denver Broncos is not like a backup linebacker standing with the Seahawks. They're two different things all together. So when you want to do something with the Broncos, eventually it's going to go to Peyton and he decides what he wants to do. That backup guy for the Seahawks, he doesn't decide. The PR guy says, you're going to do this on Thursday with SI, okay? And it's like, okay. And it's like different conversations. Um, but uh, we, do, um, we do have good relationships. We don't have a history of screwing them. We don't have a history of going in and saying we want this and taking this. We're writing about this when we really wrote about that. That's not kind of what we do. And I think because we have writers that are honest about what they're writing about and the stories are well done, that we can come in and kind of ask for that, you know, mm -hmm. and, and they believe us and, and move forward. So mm -hmm. it's, it's, it, the relationship is there and it, it works out pretty well. Mm -hmm. Any questions? Hi. With sports all year long, do you ever have any downtime? No, <laughs> I don't. I, if you do, you're always thinking about work. You know, I hear this at home a lot because I use, <laughs> I use sports as a crutch for so many things. Right. <laughs> and whenever I say I can't because there's a game on, <laughs> the answer I always hear is there's always a game on. <laughs> and there is. I mean, I watch a lot of sports and all kinds of sports, and I, I do it. So, no, not really. I am constantly in touch with it. And even when I'm on vacation, I still have a team that needs to come through me to, before right. they can do stuff. So, right, because everything know, comes through you. So. Yeah, I mean, we're all working together, right. don't get me wrong. I mean, and I have incredibly talented, capable editors. They're terrific. It's a, it's a really 
I mean, it's, it's a terrific team that I have, so I'm really fortunate. Um, but there still has to be somebody has to answer for everything, so it comes. So no, not really. <laughs> but that's okay. I, 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 there's not one complaint. On I, I love my job. <laughs> I love the magazine. I love sports. I, it's it's all. I get free swimsuit calendars. It's, it's <laughs> <laughs> I'm every boy's dream. You know what I mean? It's, 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 it's living large. <laughs> if you want a calendar, I'd be glad to give you one. <laughs> I'm, I'm curious. You talked about how much goes into selecting photos and, and photos that are going to go in the magazine or on the cover, mm -hmm. and what a process that is yeah. just to get the right one. Do you have one that you thought at the time, God, this is perfect, but then afterwards, wish you had that one back? Yeah, I mean, I think that, uh, yeah, I think there's some second guessing at some point. That's just kind of human nature. I think, uh, I think this one might have worked better in this situation. I don't think that, I don't think that we necessarily pick the wrong one, because I think it's still whatever we pick still works, because I have. Uh, Chris Hersick is our creative director, and he's as talented as anyone I've ever worked with in my life, and he makes stuff work really well. Even things that I think often it's really not ever going to make anything, and then he turns it into something through whatever way. Um, so I, I don't think we picked the wrong one, but I think that sometimes it's you look back and think, yeah, this one might have worked better, but it's it's too fluid to kind of spend too much time looking back on it, you know, and it's. It's like a newspaper. I mean, if, you, if even if you make a mistake, you only made it for 24 hours, right? And then there's another newspaper out tomorrow. So the magazine's kind of the same way. I don't, I don't dwell on it too much, but yeah. And listen, I'm in, a, I'm in a business that is incredibly subjective. You know, 10 photos will get 10 different responses from 10 different people. So, you know, it's, it's I understand that going in. It's not really a right or wrong. It's just, you know, the opinion thing. But yeah, a follow up to that question. In the, since you've been back at Sports Illustrated mm -hmm. for your third time now, what's been your favorite cover since you've been back? Like your favorite picture? That the Greg cool. Heisler cover of the Boston Marathon a year later, the 3,000 people that uh, we commandeered to come onto a street that the mayor didn't want to close when he heard the pitch. <laughs> <laughs> I can tell you that was that was by far my biggest sell of my So logistically, that was a huge shoot. Logistically, it was so like talk, a movie. It, yeah. was like, it was like being on a movie set, talk is about, what it was. Talk about the, like, all the logistics involved in that. Yeah, there, it's, it would take longer than you okay. have. But uh, <laughs> let's just say it started weeks out. The mayor would love to pose for a photo for Sports Illustrated. He's not closing down that street and not going to pose with a bunch of people. So is there anything else you need? No. And then it went from there, and eventually, uh, uh, it's, it's a long story, but yeah. uh, it will just suffice to say I convinced them to do otherwise. And they closed down the street, and we had the fire department involved, the police department involved, an emergency system involved. They closed down a subway. They rerouted buses. Wow. Is the so, mayor upset is it, at you right now? Never. He's very happy. He's on the cover. And he's right in the front. <laughs> and I'll give you a dollar if he's ever on the cover of another national magazine again. <laughs> and, you know, I mean, he's the mayor of a city. How often are they ever on the cover, you know? Plus, he got front and center, and David Ortiz didn't get front and center. David Ortiz right. didn't come. Yeah. So uh, that worked out fine for me. But uh, that was by far my favorite because I had so much invested in it. And I was, like, living in Boston for, like, days trying to get everything done. and. And they have a marathon like a few days after that that they still have to run. And I'm not completely immune to the fact that this is a city that was still getting over what happened a year earlier. It was, and Boston is ultimately a small town, you know, where everybody knows everybody. And it's this small little place. It's, it's, yeah, it's a big city, but it's not New York. It's a small little town. And everybody knew somebody who was either at the marathon or somebody in the marathon. Everybody, even though only. Fortunately, a few people actually were killed. There were tremendous injuries and this, all this stuff kind of together. It was this really personal story and the feelings were still very raw. And I was very aware of that the whole time. And so then to pull it off, it was actually really pretty emotional and, and pretty wonderful, but by far my favorite cover. Hi. Hi. Oh, uh, I had a question for Rod. Yeah. Um, as a Seahawks photographer, first off, you're probably only here so you don't get fined, I imagine. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for asking. You mentioned comments um, about when you shoot and you give it to your editor to go. Do you shoot raw and then scale it down and give them a sample? Or, and, and how much do you actually edit or crop? For the price? Seahawks or for, for Brad? Uh, for Brad. For Brad, um, she's not, 
So when I'm shooting for Brad and the Seahawks, or if I'm shooting Seahawks game for Brad and I'm shooting for the Seahawks, we're shooting raw and small JPEGs. And so we're putting them into different cards. And so all the small JPEGs are going to Brad. And she's editing off the raws. But I'm not shooting for Brad, I'm shooting just raw and she's editing raw. But if she if he's shooting for me, she's not editing for me. Yeah, right. she that's he's, a whole he's, separate thing. He's sending back to the yeah, she's, she's editing right. for the Seahawks yeah. and Ross. That's the amazement I have that when I watched your uh, five guys shooting all the Super Bowls and the amount of time you take to take yeah. Oh, yeah. an image, um, how your eye sees the crop that ultimately we see. Yeah. A lot of times I shot racing NASCAR for ten years mm -hmm. and I don't you know, the editors were always had a keen eye for that kind of crop. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, it's pretty interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, but I, I was just curious on the shooting. Yeah, in fact, I didn't see my Super Bowl images till like three days later. Like literally, a play would happen. I didn't even have like in that game, toward, especially you know, um, there were so many big plays that it was literally like just fire off a card, right? And fire off card like without having time to look back on it. And in fact, there was a point during the second quarter, or the first quarter, when um, one of our guys broke his arm on an interception return, Jeremy Lane. And I heard that on the field, someone said Jeremy Lane broke his arm, and so. I texted my editor, yeah, and I said, "Hey, Jeremy Lane broke his arm? Question mark? Like, be aware of that on that interception return." And she's like, she texted me back. She's really funny. She's like, "Really?" Question mark exclamation point. And then texted me a photo of, like, <laughs> snappage. Yeah. And I was like, "Okay, you got it. Never mind. <laughs> you do your job. I'll do mine." And she's like, "I got you, bro." <laughs> and during the game, Rod was about six feet in front of me. I was yeah. standing up against the wall in that end zone, and he, and at one point he goes, and he shows me in camera that play. Oh. It's really gross. Yeah. <laughs> but it definitely. But then uh, you're, you're surprised, probably happily, sometimes the photos you didn't see that were you let's say that how they crop them, how they look after. Oh, for them and for my editor, yeah, both. Like all I'll ever say to her is, <coughs> "How'd we do?" And she's like. We did great. And I'm like, what did we miss? And she's like, I don't think we missed much. And I'm like, great. With these guys, it just comes back and selects. Like, they don't have time to send you a full breakdown of you did this well, you did. You, it's like, this is the selects. And that tells you mm -hmm. how you did. Right. Yeah. So the level of selects you get, you know, I want a raw J, I want a raw of these, those selects yep. give you 50 or 20 or whatever. Right. Yeah. So and sometimes, it's, selects, sometimes it, it's not necessarily the quantity of the selects you get, because if you're just shooting <coughs> one player, it might just be sure. 30 selects. Like, oh, but if game. it's a game, you know, it could be a couple yeah. hundred. In my case, I used to shoot like Daytona 500. Can you imagine the picture you get? George Tiedemann was one of your big guys who shot there. Tiedemann. Yeah. 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 If you ever meet him, it's Tiedemann. Tiedemann, yeah, Rick Dole. I do that all the time. It's like, um, you, you, you know, you get yes. so many images, you just yeah. don't know which one. Right, right. Yeah. So you rely on your editors. Yeah. Two questions. The first is you're shooting with a camera that will shoot the JPEG and the RAW simultaneously, yes. right? And yes. So they, they'll have the similar numbers and they'll know exactly right. which one. Yep. Next question was is that before I knew you had this editor doing all this stuff simultaneously for you, and I congratulate you for that. I'm a pretty serious amateur, and the thing I hate most is the selecting and editing. And I'll frequently come back with 10,000 pictures or something from a trip, and I sometimes won't even see most of them because I'm not going to do it. You know? Oh, see. I, I enjoy the pleasure of taking them in the instant gratification, right. but going in and picking and selecting and getting down to the top 200 out of 10,000. Right. Uh, I love that part. Oh, that's, I love that part. That's so, what, that's what at, I'm afraid I, I'd hear. Make no mistake, at home I have the luxury of an editor. At yeah. Super Bowl I have the luxury of an editor. On a road game, it's just me. Yeah. <laughs> And I can't wait to look through. Okay, tell me your speed process then. <laughs> it's click, 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 tag, click, 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 tag. So I'm clicking in an arrow here. I mean, I'm flying through them. Yeah. And I'm tagging. And it's often like the players are done, they're dressed, the player will walk by, and they're like, are you even stopping to look at these? And they're like, did you get my touchdown, interception, sack, whatever? And I'm like, yeah. Where is it? I, did you did you like mark it special? I'm like really? <laughs> so then I stop and I go look. Everything that's marked special has a check mark, okay? Because when I press T, it puts a check mark on the photo. Here's all the T's. They're like, oh, that's sweet. And then the next thing they ask because you asked about the workflow and the Instagram and the Twitter. The new thing is, uh, could you text that to me so I can Instagram it? So then there's that level of. But yeah, it, it's a quick. It's literally. So you're saying it's quicker. It's it's arrow 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 tag arrow arrow arrow. I mean, like I well one, I was just at the game, so I know what I'm looking for. Right. And two, when you shoot a lot of sports, like there's going to be refs, there's going to be players, there's going to be frames without the ball or guys' eyes closed. I mean it. 
it's pretty obvious what you want to keep and what you don't. Yeah. Yeah. So, yep. Uh, sort of a business flow question. You're shooting full time for the Seahawks, and yet you're also doing private, you know, commercial mm -hmm. freelance for uh, buyers X, Y, and Z. Right. How how do you? I mean, during the season, you're probably tied up. Period. All Seahawks. Yeah, pretty much all Seahawks during the and season. And your your other buyers will will say, "Gee, you know, it's it's November. I'm not going to call Rob." Right. Right. But in March, but if it's during the week, but in like, March they will. Right. But if it's during the week, if it's a portrait, like they can call. They, yeah. they hey, we're going to do this. Are you available? I also have a client who, in an effort to save money, looks at the football schedule and says, hey, I, I do some advertising and marketing for a marathon group. And they'll be like, hey, uh, you guys have a night game in St. Louis on October 15th. We have a race that morning. You know, or we have a race okay. the day before or the day after or one short flight over. Can we, would you be willing to, can you stay, can you go early, da 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 da, can you double these things up? So okay. rarely that happens, but most of the time people understand football season. This football season. And yeah, in fact, I had two people who used to work together at the same organization and now they work <laughs> at different organizations and they both had something for me last weekend and one asked me during the week of Super Bowl he texted me he goes look I know you're really busy blah blah blah, blah. can you do this I'm like yeah I'll put it on my calendar but I can't talk to you for a week the other one waits two weeks and goes hey you know I know you're really busy I didn't want to bother you da, 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 da. she goes I know Dan has a polar plunge on Saturday da, 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 but can you do this for me at, in you know or is he and I'm like yeah she's like I didn't want to bother you in Super Bowl I go Dan bothered me during the Super Bowl, and she's like, that bastard. <laughs> and I ended up, like, they knew each other, so they were able to work it out. But people are, are pretty um, respectful that I can't, there are just times I'm not going to say, I can't do it. Or there are times I can't do it. You know, if, if you say no enough, or if you say later enough, the phone calls are going to stop. Right, right. That's always a risk. It's like dating. Friends. Yeah. <laughs> just like dating. Same Except thing. the difference is, Same the difference thing. is, in dating, I can't say, I can't do it, but... Bruce or Craig <laughs> are great, and you should call Bruce or Craig or or Tom, yeah. right? Like that's just that crazy. doesn't work in dating, like yeah. But in photography, you know, Probably. you can make that work. You Maybe have a one more yeah. one more last yeah. question. She, she had a, she's been raising her okay, hand. Okay, two, two more questions. All right, two more. Two more. Advice for young photographers or people who yeah. are want to be multimedia journalists. What do you guys think they should focus on? Very well. What do you think is the most important characteristics? Um, I would say if you if you want to be a photographer, let's just start with that. Really basic, and forget the multimedia part of it and all that part. You just want to be a photographer. I would say that the best way to go about that is to figure out what you enjoy taking photographs of. And it's as wide a group of subjects as there could be. It's food, it's portraits, it's news, it's police photography, whatever it is. Figure out what makes you happy and what you enjoy doing because it's a lot of time, like any other job, really spent and devoted. A lot of times, you're not even getting paid for what you're doing as you check out equipment and you practice and do self-assign and stuff like that. So have a subject that you like. If you're gonna spend that much time doing it, you better enjoy doing it. And that would be my one, number one thing, is really whatever it is, enjoy doing it. Then after you figure that out, practice on whatever level it is as much as possible and then start approaching people, moving up the food chain of who might be available to look at your photos, you know? I mean, that's to me. I think for me, I would advise you to think, and one kind of ties into what Brad said, and that's be genuine. I think the kids nowadays say, do you. Like, don't, don't try to emulate anyone else's style. You want to look at styles so that you can take pieces of different styles, but what you want to do is you want to create your style, which works with your vision, because then you'll be passionate about it. Right. Okay, like I think Bruce is amazing photographer. I could not so ever take pictures and see the world the way Bruce does. Like I've tried probably when we're in these, I was like, man, that's really cool. I'm gonna try that. Like that's not me. That's not my style. So my first thing would be be genuine, be you, with that kind of passion. Because if not, you're gonna burn out. Because, like Brad said, there's gonna be a lot of rejection along the way. I think the other piece of advice I would give to 
young people starting out is it's a business. You have to have a business sense. You have to know about income and insurance and quotes and billing and knowing all of those things. And rights. Because, and rights, yeah. I mean, there are photographers, young photographers and older photographers all over the country working for agencies and they're losing their rights and they're not getting paid very much. And they get frustrated after two years and after two years they're done. And the agency's counting on, okay, yeah, we're gonna wash those people out after two years, but there's gonna be a whole new group of people who wanna go shoot games, or they're gonna wanna shoot games for this amount of money with no rights and pay their own parking and da 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 da. So if you wanna make this a career and you wanna be long lasting, like you have to be a good business person, you have to be a decent person, and then you have to have your thing. You have to have your style. Like Brad sees a million cards, promo cards. Like if you're gonna send him, 10 in a year, you're sending one every month, he's gonna to wanna to see your style evolve and be like, yeah, you know what? I'm gonna stack of these cards. Like, look where, look what he's doing now. This is really cool. Like, he started here, now he's doing this, but he's still doing lacrosse. He's still doing action portraits. He's still doing snow right. sports. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you so much for your comments. It's been super interesting. I have a question. Um, Related to the rights issue, I guess, Rod, in your dual role as a team photographer in one, on one hand, but also doing freelance work on the other hand, I was just wondering the degree to which you ever get into situations of conflict of interest or you know, the rights of a particular image, ownership over a particular image. Right. Um, and if so, how do you reconcile that with your clients? You have to do that at the front. Like you have to have that all straightened out in the front. When I work for Brad, he's buying a usage, okay? There are other people, like I always ask, they're like, what's your rate for this? And then usually now everybody wants a buyout. They want to buy the rights to all the photos. And then you have to negotiate and say, well, this is the amount of money it would cost for you to buy the rights to all the photos. They're like, why is that so high? I was like, well, you're buying the rights to all the photos. Forever. I mean, what, what, all the rights? You know, oh yeah, they, there's a lot of people who want to buy all the yeah, rights. Like that's the new thing. Like we want all the rights. Man. We want to own these photos forever. And what you can do is a lot of times if you talk to them and say, but really, what are you using them for? Well, we want to use them on our ads and da da da. Are you going to, do you see yourself using them three years from now? Well, no, we're just going to use them this year. Well, if you want to do that, then blah, 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 blah. But that gets back to my question, my answer to his question, which is you have to be a business person and you have to understand like you're in this for the long run. Um, and you know that's why there are contracts and you have to be smart about it and there's some great books out there for photographers to, to help them learn because if not you know photographers won't be in this business very long I mean equipment is not cheap and computers are not cheap and your time is not cheap one of the things that's happened over the years really quickly is that like I said not many years ago it was just print that was all there was then suddenly there were websites so now we have two uses for images on the whole planet, that's it. Those two things editorially. Then it exploded into all these other rights, possible rights and usages, except that the contracts were still built on the print. They had not built in any of these rights for, us or for usage that they didn't see coming. And what happened is now they're asking for all these rights for in perpetuity because next year somebody in Seattle or somewhere is going to invent something that we haven't imagined yet. Nobody five years ago thought of Instagram or whatever it is, you know, there's something coming up that we haven't thought of. That's why they're trying to incorporate all the rights because it's moving so fast and you can't go around just rewriting the contract. Companies like mine, maybe an individual can, but companies right. can't just go around rewriting the contracts over and over. Now I have to include Tumblr in my contract or whatever. So that's why they want to incorporate as many rights. It doesn't matter that they may only use it for one or two. They want to buy all the rights just in case. And that's it's very common now more than ever. I so. can imagine like a projected hologram <laughs> ad over an outdoor stadium at night. Yeah. Like I could imagine that technology. Like, that's not covered. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, well, um, so the last thing, if you guys want to see the photography, this amazing photography that we're talking about tonight at the Turnbull uh, Center, which is in the White Stag building, less than a mile from yeah. here. Um, we are going to have 
uh, these two gentlemen, Rod and Brad, as, long, as well as John Ferry, uh, who Brad works with on a regular basis. Uh -huh. uh, they will be showing their work. Um, we'll have snacks starting at 5, and then starting at 5.30, they will share their work. And Bruce will be with the Blazers. Yeah, i got to work. Yeah. <laughs> It'll be fun. It'll be a fun show. And I can show you the emails with the mayor of Boston if you want. So, <laughs> <laughs> so while I stir this, did you guys get the other half of these in? The raffle tickets? Yeah. Is that how it worked? This is for one of these lovely books that features the photography of Tom Boyd, not the Oregonian. While I stir this, I've been told Rod has a, an answer for why didn't Pete Carroll run the ball? Uh, <laughs> that's, his, that's the equivalent of the why did you lay off all your photographers question that Brad just got. Yeah. Uh, my, my answer to that would be, you know what, Pete Carroll has a never once questioned my choice of lens, shutter speed, or aperture. <laughs> that was a good one. That was a good answer. <laughs> That's why you got the job. I like that. That was well, well done. Well done. I have to kill a whole belt. 941409. It's going to take home that book. Anybody have that? <laughs> you got to be here to win, I've decided. 409 is the. Oh, close. <laughs> close. All right, nobody? We'll go 404. Bingo. Wow. Nice. Nice work. There you go. Thank, you, thank you, everyone, for coming. Yes. And thank you. 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 Thank you.